Well, good afternoon. Time for a Friday live stream. And as usual, these are my opinions, but then I have the opinions of two other people here today too. So that's great. And this is going to be available on my Facebook page, on Wyoming Harpenden, on Spotify as a podcast. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, you understand that these are my views and my little webcast, but uh, not YWAMs, okay? Although I love YWAM. So I have two younger YWAMers with me. Do you mind being called YWAMers? It's yeah. new to me. I've never been called a YWAM <laughs> yeah. before. No, I'm well so and truly they, in the club. <laughs> so they're kind of new to it. There's Elise Green here and Mateus Carvalho. And they have some things in common. Can you think about the things in common? What are they? Tell us. Matthias, what? Well, I think we both grew up in the same town, going to schools in Harpenden, uh, here where we currently are. Um, both connected to Wyme Harpenden specifically in one way or another. So personally, actually, I grew up on base with my parents being Wyme was on base as well. Um, so, so what do you mean on base? Does that mean that, that you were raised in a sort of dormitory with all the other Wyme children? No. <laughs> So like half Wild Harvard is quite a big base, and yeah. so like the staff and students live quite separately, and so I was able to grow up not feeling too trapped or too like kind of enclosed in like a dormitory or in like a like yeah. a campus. Uh, but I did grow up surrounded by a Christian community and okay. a wine cultured community as well. Okay, and so you had a flat or apartment that your family had, you yes, ate meals together and yeah. all that. Okay, mm -hmm. so, all right, so that's a little bit of what it's like to grow up in one. Mm -hmm. And at least you didn't grow up on this property. The property was my playground down the road, hill. Yeah. So we were always up. Yeah, and every in fact, Sunday. your dad grew up here. Yep, my dad from, grew up here. Pool, probably about 11 years old. Yeah. Yeah, I think we moved here when he was 11. 85, 86. So at least his dad is. Our second son, and they lived uh, about a mile away, what? a yep. ten, 10, 15 minute walk. Yeah. Yeah. Nice okay. and convenient. Mm. And did you go to the same schools? No, I think I went to, we went to two different schools at. Yeah. Okay. So they were close to each other though. Did you feel like you got a pretty good education? I definitely did. I feel like I really enjoyed the education I received and it was very good quality. Yes, yeah. at least. I definitely did. And then I, went, I finished sixth form at your school. Cool. Yeah. 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 Which was the best part. Okay, you have something else in common that you did after school, which was? Well, I, uh, we both did a uh, discipleship training school with YOM. Um, in, I think I did it in Norway, and you did yours. I think you did it in Norway. I definitely did mine in Norway. <laughs> I did it in <laughs> Hawaii, mm. and then went back, and then also went to have, have you two talked to, to each other about your experiences in the different schools? Very briefly. We haven't talked much. I've, I've, yeah, I've only just completed mine. Okay, so we had, I've not had a lot of time to talk to many people. And at least you, you... I've talked to you about mine. Yeah, you completed Fairly, yours when? Yeah. I did <laughs> mine January 2019 until June 2019. Okay. Yeah. So years reflect years. back on, on that. Uh, what was your state of mind and socialization <laughs> and spiritual state when you went to the school? <laughs> I... And knowing a bit of what it was, why in the world did you do a DTS? <laughs> I was well and truly an atheist and was proudly... Were you pretending to be an atheist or were you a serious atheist? I don't know. I really don't know. I, it never occurred to me that God might be real. So I would say I was just a passive atheist. I, like, I wasn't angry or I hadn't been hurt. I didn't choose atheism. I just thought... I've been brought up Christian, but I had no reason of my own to believe it. And so so there was no, no encounter with God. Yeah. But you'd been raised in immediate proximity. Yeah. And my incredible witness didn't make any difference. <laughs> I honestly, and I tell you this, my favorite songs were worship songs, and I would sing them. And the words in the songs are like, God, like, I'm yours, you're mine. But it just never clicked in my head that... <laughs> God's real. I never even, like, I know all the lyrics and it never occurred to me what I was actually saying until after I met God and then I was like, oh God, I've been declaring this for years. Um, so, so you weren't actually using your brain? No, <laughs> that's one way to say it. Thanks, Pablo. Um, yeah, so now I went to Kona, Hawaii, uh, not believing in God. I went to get away from England. Six months in Hawaii sounded nice. I didn't sure. know that 
there was three months of an outreach, so I thought it was just six months so I lived in Hawaii. So worst that happens, I so find out. <laughs> you didn't do any research? No. <laughs> no. Just wanted to get away. Mm -hmm. All right, I will come back to what happened when you went. So, Matthias, why, why did you go to Norway and, and what was it like and an arrival there? Well, I, I went, well, I was going to take a gap year uh, in 2020. And because of COVID, all of my plans for the gap year were kind of thrown sure. out the window. Yeah. And I literally, well, I grew up in and around why I'm in and around people doing DTSs. And the thing that was going through my head is that I had nothing better to do for six months. <laughs> and it was, it was kind of the same. I get to go to a new culture and, and visit some international people. And get to have a good time. It was. It was. It was. I had nothing better. So it, it wasn't. It wasn't like you had some call on your life no. for missions or anything, huh? I actually didn't want to do one. I didn't want to do one for the longest time. Um, maybe out of spite or out of rebellion, just because I grew up in and around why I'm so much and around so many people doing a DTS, and I kind of wanted to be different. So for the longest time, I didn't want to do one. There, there is something, isn't there, about being a teenager? Uh, it was for me too. Mm. Um, that's the decade, more or less, in which you begin to realize you're an individual and initially in that process, you start finding your own identity by being different than your parents yeah. mm -hmm. and different than the people around you. In some ways, being in a Christian environment means you're, you're, you're all, most teenage young people from a Christian environment are, are going to decide they're not for a while just because they're trying to establish that they are not just a product of the influences on yeah, them. Yeah, they're in So you convinced yourself quite thoroughly, didn't you, Lisa, that you were yeah. not a Christian? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell us what you did when you first went to this DTS in Hawaii. What I did, I walked, what up, you to said my, and did? I walked up to my school leader on the first day and said, just to clarify, I'm not here for God. I'm not here for these teachings. I'm here for CrossFit. Um, don't talk to me about God. Don't talk to me about my testimony or my family, and they asked me about it. I said the same thing to my roommates. I was unfolding, unpacking my clothes, folding them. I was facing away from all my roommates, and I was like, just to clarify, no one talked to me about God. No one asked to pray for me. I don't want to talk about God in the room. Like, and they were all just behind me, like, so confused. Um, so that's how I entered my DTS. Well, you, were trying, you were trying actively to avoid yes. the faith issue for yourself. Yes. Why? I don't know. I was just trying to make a statement. <laughs> like, I wasn't here for that. And clarify, like, don't think that I'm one of you. I'm not. Yeah, in a way, that's it. That's still that same thing about individualiz individualization yeah. of saying, I'm not a sheep. I'm yeah. not here like all the rest of you. I'm me. I'm different. Yeah. yeah. And it wouldn't have been true to myself if I walked in and didn't say that, yeah. I think. I, yeah. I didn't really think it through, though. It was just what I said. I didn't really think anything. But it was true, through. wasn't it? Yeah, it was true. It was true. What about you? What, what, what would you say was your spiritual state, your socialization state, uh, when you got to, to Norway? Well, I think for the longest time, having grown up in a Christian environment, I was it was God and having that personal relationship with God was something that I was pursuing. But actually, I think growing up, it was filled with disappointment. On my behalf, I think I was very disappointed with me pursuing things with God, like a relationship with him and a connection with him and then not feeling like I felt anything. So going to, to Norway, I was quite, I, I felt I was quite bitter just because the disappointment that I'd received before having pursued, having pursued God had uh, kind of made me that way. So arriving, I, I, was, I, I, I didn't believe in God. I think I was open with on my application as well and with the leaders, not quite as explicitly. <laughs> but I was very open and open, openly kind of challenging them of their beliefs and challenging teachers as well. So I arrived quite uh, almost argumentative in yeah. a yeah. sense, just kind yeah. of wanting to question everything, mainly because, uh, yeah, I, I don't know why. Maybe because I was, I wanted, having, having pursued it before, I wanted to be correct going into a DTS. Right. And right. I didn't want to be proven wrong. Uh, so I was oftentimes challenging like the teachers and the and the staff members and often sometimes even the students as well how, how'd that go <laughs> i mean it was it was a it was a real eye-opener for me at least in that kind of teaching me how and when to be bold and how and when to <laughs> and to be open and 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 kind of challenge your my beliefs because i often at the beginning at least i found myself uh challenging other students 
which I found very well, which I later found out to be very unhealthy for myself and for the other students as well, <laughs> mainly because they can't answer my questions or, yeah. or, or like yeah. help me out, and I'm not going to help them out of my faith because I wanted to be there to grow my faith. I went there wanting to pursue, like wanting to to encounter God and wanting to 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 get what I've seen my whole life through other people, right? And I wanted right. them to, to have that as well. And so after a bit, after a couple of weeks of of being uh, bold with my beliefs with students and staff, I realised that maybe I needed to reevaluate the ways in which I was going about things and try be I don't know be less openly bitter or less <laughs> openly yeah. uh, more concealed. Can yeah. I quote you? Well, well but... can I quote you? The last thing he said to me before his details, can I? Yes, you can quote Well, me. I told him God, God was real, and he said, that's your truth, that's not mine. God's not your real. Truth, and we, oh, we got into like a... That's very postmodern. Yeah. yeah, we got into a big, bold mm. discussion <laughs> <laughs> about God before he left. So uh, you've, you've used the term bitter two or three times. Mm. That's a really strong word. What, what, what led to the bitterness? Uh, how, how would you describe the factors that, that went together to, to say, uh, I'm bitter? Well, I think growing up, actually, it, when I, growing up in YM, I was able to see a lot of people have this on fire and personal relationship with God. And it looks amazing. It looks incredible, like having people feel free and, and in Christ and have this, this intense relationship, this personal relationship with the creator is something that I pursued as well. And so growing up in YM and going to church and youth groups and youth camps and things like that, it was always something that I pursued. But to, for, 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 all problems due to myself, when I did pursue these things, um, I didn't feel like I received everything back uh, on God's part, which led to a lot of disappointment and a lot of frustration. And this was like an ongoing cycle since maybe the age of 13, which is when, okay. I, when I started okay. questioning until the age of 16, which is when I kind of chose to give up on actively pursuing God. Right, so you were looking for some real experience, something mm. subjective, Something that touched your whole being. Exactly. Uh, as a result of you saying, "God, I want to know you," mm -hmm. nothing happened. Exactly. Yeah, and that 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 could make you wonder if maybe God's not interested in you. Mm. Yeah, and that could make you bitter, could it? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of went that way. And it was yeah, and it was very frustrating, like mm. putting a lot of investing a lot of your time and a lot of your personal like kind of emotional energy in something and not feeling like you've received anything on the latter half. Yeah, I, I can identify with mm -hmm. that even. In, yeah. I was a teenager a, a little while ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> uh, same thing, you know. Mm. Okay, well, okay, God, when are you going to touch me? You know, mm -hmm. when I'm, I see these people worshiping and having a great time, and uh, if I do that, it's going to be hypocritical. So when are you going to change this? Mm -hmm. And no answer. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back to that, all right? Because yeah. <laughs> we'll you're not still there, are you? Oh, uh, cool. no, no, no. Okay, all <laughs> yes. right. All right, so at least how did the change start with you? Because you came back and you're talking to him about God's real. Yeah. Uh, whereas you were a self-confessed atheist yes. uh, a few months earlier. What? How, how did the change start? Well, I don't know, it's interesting because listening to you say you're bitter about God and you're waiting for him to show up your, your whole life, and I was the opposite. I got there and I was like, don't, <laughs> like, don't <laughs> touch me, don't reveal yourself to me. I'm scared. Like, I don't want to know. What were you afraid of? That he wouldn't be as good as as what I had in my mind, I guess. And that, ah. and that so much of what was being taught on DTS about his character, you know, this everlasting love and this father who would never let you down and this friend and this companion and this shepherd, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it just goes on and on and on. You're like, how is that even real? And how is he even so good that there can be a God that you can talk to? It just felt way too good to be true. And so I was like, I'd rather not open myself up for disappointment. And so don't show yourself to me. Right. And then, I mean, he chased me down. And it was like a complete, like, attack. <laughs> I was, like, what, running. When was the first time you, you thought, oh, he is real? It's, it's, something's happening here. I think I think it, was a, it wasn't so much of a moment. It was very much an accumulation of, it was people prophesying over me and things starting to connect with other prophecies and they would match up. Uh, explain, if somebody doesn't know anything about yeah. being prophesied so, over, what's, what's um, going People on? were coming up to me, asking to pray for me and then saying that they felt like God was saying, this is who you are, this is what you've been through, this is what God has for you, this is what you will do in your mm -hmm. life. 
and things started to add up and I ended up getting the same kind of vision from people or image that God had given them three or four times and they didn't know each other. This campus is huge. It's like, what, three 3,000 people? A lot of people. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, other stuff where, like, people would come up and share stuff that they felt like God said that they really shouldn't know and that I'd never told anyone, not even my brother and my dad. Um, and so it just started to feel like, I haven't told anyone this and there's no reason if there's not a God, why someone would come up to you and be like, hey, I feel like God's, you know, it, just, it doesn't make any sense yeah. logically. And I really started to break it down logically. And the only conclusion that you can come to is something's going on here. And, and then it started to really make me uneasy because I was like thinking, if God's real, then so are, you know, angels and demons and the devil and, it, and heaven mm -hmm. and hell. And I was like, how far does it go and how much of it is true and how much of it is just from stories and from horror movies and what's actually reality and it was that's a good question so yeah know. but it was really scary like it, it kept yeah. me up at night because so i was like if demons are real i don't i don't want to believe in god so you're already grappling with things and being kept awake because of the thought yeah because hmm? it's a lot <laughs> it is, yeah. is life-changing in yeah. every aspect and how, how did the changes start with you what, what what was your experience in the face say the first month or so i think the first month was uh I've been growing up in Wyoming. I think I, I, I was able. I've been very saturated with a lot of Christianese, if you will, and <laughs> the, a lot of the first month, Christianese. Christianese is, is that like Christianese? <laughs> <laughs> but like just a lot of Christian teachings and and words. Christian words and jargon and things like that. And so for the first, I think quite immediately actually, maybe the first couple of weeks, I was told. I think two people prophesied over me, and it was it was. Something it was two two different visions or, or pictures with the same kind of message, and it was it was the message to kind of just to step back a bit and to 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 kind of take a, a, a wider perspective and look at everything as if you, you were looking at it all brand new. And so hmm. from the very beginning, that was what I was most kind of trying to focus on. So not be. Uh, influenced by what I'd heard before and try to listen to everything as if I'm listening to it for the first time. And I think that was that was something I'd not done before ever in my life. And so when maybe the first, like maybe this is the second week, after like the second week I started listening to the teachings and I was so able early. to... Yeah, it was early. Yeah, this was very early, which was helpful for me as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I was able to really, sit from the beginning, have a new perspective on what I was hearing and mm. on like things like God's character and like it's just simple truths, like God's like, God loves you. Yeah. Or, or he's yeah. yeah, he will always be there for you. Things that I've heard a thousand times in my life before, but I'd never had the opportunity to sit down and think about what that implies in my own life. That's a really interesting comment because I think one of the things that makes a discipleship training school work makes almost anything mm -hmm. work if you are away from your normal life, yeah, uh, your, your sort mm -hmm. of routines uh, with new people. And you're there for God's purposes. You're there to say, well, here I am, Lord. Uh, I think you can do almost anything and have significant change. But DTS is particularly designed to bring about maturing and change. So how did, how did that impact you? At least you started getting prophecies and you started opening up. And, and yeah. then what? Well, then I started listening more and then I started stopped stop skipping class and stop skipping <laughs> worship and stop skipping intercession and I remember texting the family group chat and being like they're making us do something called intercession <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea what it was didn't want to be part of it oh and I love it you know and just stuff that I stopped rebelling and decided okay maybe I should give this a shot and I came I've come so far across the world and I also was thinking I've got so much longer of this to get through it's going to be really tiring if I keep purposely pushing it away it's really yeah. exhausting yeah and what what is benefiting like it it does nothing for me so i just thought okay i'll, I'll give in a bit and and then i'm quite a vulnerable person at heart and i wasn't at all before i went and so when people are praying over you and they're saying things that kind of touch the nerve in your heart and you want to be vulnerable but at the same time you, you want to be so proud and i just started to cut out the pride and it meant that so quickly God could get in when I just stopped running. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the image that someone had got for me is that you spent 18 years just running away from God and you don't even need to turn around, you just stop. 
like, and he'll come yeah. and um, meet you exactly where you're at. And that's something that really hit me was, okay, he'll meet you where you're at. I don't need to be this perfect person and I don't need to be what I had in my mind of what Christianity was. I can be me right now and that's enough. Yeah. And once I grasped that, it was really easy to be like, actually, okay, I'm, I'm all right with being met by love. And I had this weird thing in my mind where all the staff or like really anyone there who wasn't a student was at level 100, right? And and mm -hmm. that was just how you, you just gradually got to level 100. And then once you were there, you were a Christian and that was it. You knew everything there was to know about God. You knew, like all the hard questions, you knew all the answers. I was like, I can't wait, wait to be there. And then I remember <laughs> on outreach, my staff member talking to me about stuff she was wrestling with. And just this bubble was just burst. I'm like, you've been a Christian your whole life and you're still wrestling with stuff that I am. And mm. it, I was like, that sucks. <laughs> but now it's exciting because it's part of the yeah. adventure and it would be awful if you just reached a point where you knew everything. But, yeah, it was all revelation after revelation that gradually just opened up my perspective to how great it was. And then you want to give in more because you've the little bit that you've tasted was so good. It's a great way to say it. Um, I'm going to come back to you and ask you to summarize what it meant to you. But, but I'll come back to Mateus. Hmm. In your experience, can you describe the process over those months? Can you describe what was happening in you? What was happening intellectually in mm -hmm. you? What was happening spiritually in you? Can you describe me that? I think, uh, well, I think well, Jack, the DTS started in January, and uh, it got to a point we were actually at a cabin on a little, they call it an adventure week or a <laughs> track week, where we just go out and do whatever our track was. So I did an outdoor track, and we were at a cabin in the middle of somewhere. And we were just having a little worship session inside the cabin. And whilst I was, whilst I was in there, I'd, during the worship time, uh, I'd had a little realization that I'd never given my life to Jesus ever. Is that right? I'd never <laughs> given it to Jesus ever uh, in my life. I think I did that maybe when I was four, but not really knowing what it meant yeah. or the implications of it. But I hadn't since. Um, and I was there and I was thinking, why, why uh, don't I, why haven't I received anything? Why, why don't I feel God any more than I did at the start? Uh, and then it, I just had a little realization that why, uh, as I questioned myself as to why I hadn't given my life to Jesus. Yeah. And I'd realized it's because I knew that if I'd given my life to Jesus, I would have to dedicate the rest of my life to Christianity, yeah. Yeah. not being sure. Yeah. And, and I, I kind of just decided that it was worth the risk of like, if God wasn't real, like, and I gave my whole life to him, then that, that'd suck. Yeah. But if he was real and I gave my life to him, it'd be so much better. So I, that, that day was, I think, 8th of February, and I, I gave my life, and it was like, yeah, I, I, I think it's worth the risk to do this and to take that step towards yeah. Jesus and towards wanting to know him and like, actually investing something, like some, some time, like the rest of my life to it. And after that was when, like, it was like a switch. After that was when I started listening to, to lectures and I started reading the Bible, and I was able to personally place myself or like, yeah, place myself in, in, in the situations they were talking about or place myself in the teachings that the Bible was telling me and personally kind of, yeah, feel personally invested to, to what, what the teachers were saying, what the Bible was telling me. I think that's when like the, there was a switch in, within myself uh, that, that, that day, 8th of February. That was really good. That's, that's really interesting, isn't it, that uh, you were expecting something personal, subjective, mm. emotional, uh, through your teen years until you turned off mm -hmm. at what, 16? 16. Yeah. But the thing is, you'd never given your life to the Lord un unconditionally. No. Uh, my experience was just the same. You know, I, I had different experiences, but they were never lasting. You know, you think, oh, this is just superficial. But I had never totally given my life to the Lord, never surrendered, capitulated, mm. submitted. You know, and when I did, mm. then... And it wasn't so subjective for me, but everything started changing. And I guess that's you too. And, and so how would you describe the change? You look back on that time. I know you've continued to change since then. You've continued to grow. But if you just look at that six-month period, uh, summarize the changes that happened. Oh, man. One big one that I think about a lot is I stopped lying. And just little lies here and there. I think that was the first thing I felt convicted about. Um, before I actually even said, God, if you're real, like, I give you this, it was this kind of step towards him, I guess. I just started to feel 
convicted and guilty about lying when I never had before in my life. And I thought, okay, there must be a correlation here. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't big eyes, but they were big enough that yeah. something in me was woken up to this isn't okay. And then it was, it was so small. It was like, stop using people's moisturizer when they're not in the room <laughs> or like stop using people's conditioner in the shower. Just stop <laughs> eating people's food without asking. And it was, you know, all along that line. And, um, and then after I did that tiny bit of obedience, which felt, it did feel really small. It was suddenly like this whole world was open to these are all the ways that you can follow me. And the, those six months were literally just day by day. How can I get closer to you? What else can I Terrific. give up and stop doing to get closer to you? But it didn't feel like a cost. It felt like shedding off these outer layers of just filth and stuff that I'd built up over 18 yeah. years I didn't want yeah. to be anymore to just reveal actually who I was. And then, you know, each layer that comes off, you can feel yourself thriving, you can feel yourself coming back alive and kind of feel yourself getting closer to God and who you should yeah. be. And that's what it was. It was just six months of finding out, actually, this is who I am and this is who I'm not. Now, that thing of lying is so crucial, isn't it? Because if you become an habitual liar, and it's often just in little things, yeah. but it's the little things that people think that doesn't add up, and it, and it makes all your relationships shallow and untrusting. Yeah. Uh, and, you, you know, and you can't live that way because we're made for genuine relationships. So yeah. how, how do you look back on, on how would you summarize the overall impact? Um, I think the biggest impact on me is like scripture and the way I read the Bible. I think I hadn't read the Bible for, since the age of 16. I hadn't owned a Bible since the age of 16. I gave them all away. <laughs> on a mission trip, so on a mission trip I went to, I think I had three or four, and I gave them all away. That's not what mission trips are for. <laughs> I wanted, yeah, I, I gave them all away. I never got another one, and I hadn't read it in two years. And so when I first, actually, I, I stole a Bible actually from the training building on this base. I took one of the student Bibles, and because I didn't own one, I think the week before I left for the UTS. And so I took it, and for the first. And until I'd given my life, it was it was a chore, like reading my Bible yeah. in the yeah. mornings. It was like yeah. studying for a test. It was like, oh, I need to do this this morning because I want to grow my faith, therefore this is yeah. what I do. And I was reading it and not really taking anything in. And I think after I'd given my life, I, was, I started reading the Bible and I started thinking, okay, I am now God's people. This is who I'm talking, this is who they're talking about. Like, he yeah. died for, for, for me because yeah. I've given my life and to Jesus, therefore I am who he's talking about. And so... Reading the Bible after that was when I started becoming a bit more like kind of passionate and invested in what it was saying, and ah, it was it was amazing. It yeah. was so good reading it after, yeah. and it was yeah. it was almost <laughs> I don't know, I was personally interested in what he had to say to me, what God had to say to me through the Bible, yeah. and I think a big realization that I had on my DTS that it was something I feel like I'd, I'd lost maybe in my because of the generation I was born in, but in that like in the importance of the Bible in my faith and the fact that God can and does speak to me personally through the Bible. And so when, it, when reading the Bible after that, I was able to, God was able to speak to me through the Bible in, in several ways, in several different occasions, for several different reasons. And it was, it was amazing. And it's this, this tangible book, which is yeah. something I was, I was searching yeah. for. Yeah. I was searching for something tangible that I could feel, taste, touch, yeah. or like, um, and, and, it, and I was kind of blinded to that, the Bible and I wasn't really yeah. picking up. But then I realized that this, this is the thing I was looking for. And That's it is great. something that I'm able to use to, to personally create a relationship with God and for him to specifically talk to me in specific yeah. different ways. Yeah. And so that's something that I'd realized and, and meant I was a lot more interested and interested in what God had to say to me through the Bible. That's great. Uh, just the last thing, we're mm. running out of time, so we'll, yeah. shift, uh, we'll wrap it up here, but we could go on a long time. Mm. Uh, what's next for you? I'm going to, in, this, in a couple of months, I'm going to move to Norway for a year to work with The Send. It's a Christian organization. It's like an event, a 12-hour event where people come. And it's built around the idea that the world's ready for the revival. Yeah. And so it's to bring Christians together, yeah. to, to worship together and to praise together and to just bring the, a fire for the Holy Spirit to a nation. Now, we didn't say earlier, you are Brazilian ethnically by background, yes. aren't you? Mm. I went to the Sin in Brazil, mm. and I know they were hoping for 120,000 and you know, uh, maybe 150,000. Mm. And then just as I was leaving, because I, I went to two of the stadiums and, and then there was a third one. Yeah. I, 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 I was Lauren Cunningham's bodyguard for the day. <laughs> 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 it was such a fun day. 
And at the end of it, we, we, we heard they had, between the three locations, they had 190,000 mm. young people there. Yeah. And being in those stadiums and seeing so mm. many of them, you know, all holding their shoes up that they were prepared to go to, to the ends of the earth with the gospel, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So the send in Europe is going to be great. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and that's in 2022, isn't it, in the yes. summer? Yes, June 25th, 2022. Okay, okay. So, so what's next for you, Elise? Next for me is Norway as well, huh? but not for the send. Staying in YWAM, so in this global organization, um, to staff the DTS, so the school that I did, the six month school. So I committed to two years, so that's two schools. Okay. But Norway is looking more and more closed. So trusting the Lord. Because and, of visas and yeah. COVID restrictions and so on, it'll come through. Yeah. It'll come through. Things are loosening up. I say confidently. Yeah, in faith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, it's it's great talking to, to both of you, and and uh, wonderful to know you're, you're in Norway. I love Norway. Mm. Fact is, when the COVID restrictions hit, I was in Trondheim, and uh, we caught the last flight out. Oh wow! <laughs> so, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, we were. So, lo love Norway, and there's something very special going on there. Yeah, for sure. And why in Norway is very alive and and dynamic, and I I think that. Um, what they're igniting there will spread much, much wider yeah. across Europe. And we, we need it here in the UK. So learn all you can, and then you, you can come back and organize the send. In great. In great. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. So thank you very much for, for watching. Uh, I just enjoy seeing the way God's changed people's lives. Uh, and it's reminiscent now. For me now, it's over 50 years ago, but, but just exactly the same, you know? went out of meandering around and confused and so on to, to clear learning, being able to, to integrate my faith and my reasoning. And, and I'm going to do another uh, live stream on that that you'll see next week. Uh, exciting thing to get your life on track and have a sense of purpose. So I hope you enjoyed it like I did and see you next week. When we look out and see thousands that don't know Jesus, it draws forth our response. No longer will fear, passivity, and doubt control our lives, but instead, an extraordinary courage will take its place. And what if that courage is the answer to a whole generation of believers going all in for Jesus? We see an opportunity to respond, not only with words, but also with our actions. Where neighborhoods, families, schools, and the nations are met by the love of Jesus. The time for action is now, and it starts with us. On the 25th of June, 2022, The Send is coming to Europe with its first ever gathering in Norway. Are you ready to go all in?